Julia Widdop with Talk Story TV, and today I have with me Mike Bond, who is going to be talking to us about his latest book, Saving Paradise. So tell us a little bit about your book, Mike. Well, Saving Paradise is the story of a uh, Hawaiian surfer growing up on the big island now lives on Oahu, which is uh, one of the best places on earth for surfing, and uh, who after 9-11 went into the army and from then into special forces, ended up in Iraq and Afghanistan, now is back uh, in Hawaii. Uh, teaching surfing uh, as a surfing correspondent uh, for surfing magazines all over the world, and who gets caught up uh, in the brutal murder of a beautiful young uh, Honolulu uh, reporter, newspaper reporter. And this uh, this opening incident, which is really the beginning of the book and serves as a metaphor, if you wish, for the book, uh, leads to his eventually being blamed for her murder and his the necessity that he both at the same time avoid capture and find her real murderers uh, and deal with them. So, uh, it's, it's pretty, according to reviews, it's certainly a thriller. Uh, and very exciting from page to page, uh, but in addition, it's a metaphorical novel in the sense that the beautiful young Hawaiian uh, who was killed at the start is Hawaii itself. And so the book is also, it's been called an eco-novel, an eco-thriller. It's an attempt to come to grips with and warn everybody who cares that Hawaii is going fast and that we better protect what's left or we're going to lose it in the next few years. Yes, and that's particularly disturbing considering that North Korea is threatening to bomb Hawaii. Yeah. Who is threatening? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Up. North Korea? North Korea, yeah. Yeah, North Korea. They, they're, that's another crazy thing. They are just stark raving mad, those people. Um, I don't think there's much likelihood of that in that uh, their missiles cannot deliver ordnance that far, number one. And number two, uh, we have plenty of ways of inter intercepting those missiles before they get to Hawaii. But Hawaii has always been, as we know from uh, December 7th, 1941, Hawaii has always been, if you wish, an American outpost. Uh, though many Hawaiians would wish that it would be independent. Uh, and uh, there's a very strong move in Hawaii against uh, inclusion within the United States. Though everyone is aware that the financial links now between Hawaii and the mainland are so strong that such uh, such a separation would be financially devastating for Hawaii. Yeah, and what do you feel is um, in your book? Which there's so many threats to Hawaii that I personally mm -hmm. know of. Which ones do you talk about in the book? Well, basically what I talk about in the book is what I call the semi symbiosis of politics, such that what happens in Hawaii politically has nothing to do with, the, with what's best for the Hawaiian people. It is totally focused on how do we get uh, bigger corporations and how do our corporations make more money, how can we develop more land and pull in more tourists. Uh, the entire political structure, with few exceptions, is uh, totally focused on, on uh, helping the guys in power, the people in power. And uh, in my book, Saving Paradise, I have a chapter called Thieves and Liars, where I talk about that. I draw many illusions between politics in Hawaii and those in Afghanistan. And as I say, our, the majority are really good people, but there's enough thieves and liars uh, in the case of uh, politicians in both places that ruin it for everybody. And so I would say that the biggest overall risk uh, to Hawaii is exactly that, and I'm going to pull out from Saving Paradise one of the statements I make at the end uh, about precisely that. And... Uh, and I talk about the geology of Hawaii, which is a series of tectonic shifts which created the volcanic action which made these islands. And I say, just like the tectonic shift that has created these beautiful islands, 
we need a tectonic shift in governance so we actually can control what happens to us. As Thomas Jefferson said, most bad government results from too much government. And when corporations tell politicians what to do, it's always the people who pay. And going through all of this trauma of the book, what I mean is when the hero went through all of this incredible procedure of being attacked for having found this, this dead woman, uh, he's become more aware of how the slimy symbiosis, as I said earlier, between politicians and corporations overrides the public will and our common good. I, and I think this, this is uh, true not only in Hawaii, it's true everywhere. And, and uh, for instance, the major issue here in the book uh, in terms of politics and corporations was a huge wind, industrial wind project which the governor and some of his cronies wanted to put on the island of Molokai, which uh, is one of the, the five major, six major, depending on how you count it, Hawaiian islands. And it, is rated by many as the most beautiful. Uh, National Geographic rates it as the sixth most beautiful island in the world. And uh, the governor and his cronies, including the Monopoly Utility, which is one uh, step above uh, debt uh, rating by the rating agencies, uh, uh, it, it, they decided they wanted to put a huge uh, industrial wind facility across a good part, uh, 17 square miles of Molokai, basically destroy the island's environment, destroy the communities, chase the people out, whatever it took. And that was a series of battles which the people in, in Molokai had to fight over a period of two years and just now have won. Uh, and yet, this battle against industrial wind is going on not just in Hawaii, it's going on all over the nation and all over the world. Uh, and some people don't realize that wind projects don't lower CO2 or greenhouse gases and they don't reduce fossil fuel use at all. They're just a huge uh, corporate scam that borrows money, that the government borrows money uh, from debt markets and, and gives to the wind producers in the form of subsidies and which adds to our national debt enormously. Uh, and uh, the reason why wind projects don't lower uh, greenhouse gases is because wind is very erratic and when the blades turn sometimes don't turn, so other times the wind keeps going up and down. You have to run a fossil fuel plant full time to back these turbines up. And in many cases in the UK uh, and in other states in the Union, they found that wind projects actually increase the uh, consumption of fossil fuels and the production, the production of uh, greenhouse gases. So you have something that costs billions of dollars and which involves running a high-voltage cable through the U.S. National uh, Humpback Whale and Marine Sanctuary, again, at great damage, uh, all to make money for investment banks and oil companies, which own most of the, uh, the national, the uh, large wind companies. They're not owned by greenies, they're owned by the oil companies. B, you know, uh, British uh, Petroleum, uh, BP, which gave us the uh, Gulf of Mexico oil spill, they have many, many wind projects all over the country and are forcing them down people's throats. So uh, I think that, that one of the important things that I was trying to get at in Saving Paradise is it's not just in Hawaii. We're going to save paradise. We have to do it nationally and internationally. And I'll give you two other examples. In the state of Maine right now, the government is overruling the state government agencies are consistently overruling the will of the people in a number of communities that don't want these hideous wind farms and are imposing them on the communities, destroying the rooftops, destroying the property values, making people sick, driving them from, from their homes, murdering thousands and thousands of birds and bats. Uh, all for power to go down the transmission line to New Jersey, which could much more easily produce the power with rooftop solar. And where a lot of it is lost in the transmission line, and, and it's, it's a whole ridiculous scam. But two of the previous governors uh, of Maine uh, retired from the government from the governor's office to go on and make millions of dollars in the wind industry. And they wrote the laws before they left office. So that's the kind of scummy uh, situation we have politically in this country, whether it's Illinois, uh, Washington State, Hawaii, Maine, you name it. Um, and it's not just wind projects. Uh, 
so many areas, uh, basically the people of the United States are losing control of the government, and the government, as I say at the end of uh, Saving Paradise, is becoming the enemy of the people because it's imposing corporate will uh, on communities and, and the entire nation. So that, in a long-winded way, if, if you wish, Julia, is mine, is the underlying nonfiction drive of what is a fiction book. Right. So, and how do, do you have a happy end? Does the book have a happy ending? I would say so, yeah. People tell me it does. Uh, I think we're going to have a happy ending. Uh, the opposition uh, to wind projects nationwide and worldwide is growing stronger and stronger as they find it. They do two things. They destroy tourism and they substantially lower property rights. So all across the country, people are really starting to fight back. Uh, and so, yeah, the book has what you might call a moderately happy ending. Whenever somebody dies uh, early on in the book, you can't say, you can't say it's a totally happy ending. But right. It certainly wasn't for the person who had to get sacrificed. But um, I take a good look also in the book at the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, which I uh, know perhaps too well, uh, and which I'm now in the process of finishing another book on. Uh, and the first one particularly was in the Iraq war was an example of something that was imposed on the people of the United States with no purpose whatsoever other than to make Bush and Cheney look good for themselves. Uh, there were no weapons of mass destruction. There was absolutely no need for the United States to go into Iraq, and yet the government decided we would go in, and lots of young Americans lost their lives in addition to somewhere between 600,000 and a million Iraqis, and a country was destroyed, and our national debt went from, what, $10, $10 trillion to $17 trillion. So, and so the defense contractors made uh, their fortunes. I'm sorry, I, I've got and my so speaker down too And contractors long. made their fortunes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and Cheney was connected with them. And it's interesting that Dick Cheney, who was vice president at the time, had gotten five uh, deferments in the Vietnam War so that he would not have to go to war to defend our country. And uh, G.W. Bush had, had his daddy put him in the Texas uh, Air Force Reserve so he wouldn't have to go. And his daddy put him way ahead of, uh, I believe, 3,200 other candidates for the Air Force Reserve. Uh, so you have, in essence, a White House uh, that's never seen war, has no idea what war is, but feels they have to make their mark. So they made their mark, and uh, everybody else paid for it. Mm -hmm. And that's another underlying threat, if you wish, in Saving Paradise, is what war does to our veterans. And we... We send young men off to war or young women off to war, and when they come back, no matter what shape they're in, we ignore them. And we go on to other things, and our veterans are out there and need help. Yeah, so, and even the, even the active duty soldiers are, most of their families are eligible for food stamps. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's ridiculous. While the people who invest in the arms business make millions. So, but whoever said life was fair, I suppose. Uh, anyway, these are the kind of topics in a thriller mode that I deal with in Saving Paradise. Um, I've always used the uh, novel approach, uh, the approach of a thriller, if you wish, to deal with serious questions. Uh, one of my other books uh, dealt with, which is uh, being reissued later this spring, uh, called The Last Savannah Deals with Elephant Poaching in Kenya and uh, a manhunt in Kenya where a former intelligence officer decides to hunt down the poachers. Uh, and uh, my, some of my other books have been related to uh, human rights violations uh, in Central America, things like that, and, or the war in the Middle East, which I have unfortunately too much uh, experience in. Did you go there? I've been in the Middle East many times, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, how many books have you written? Well, this is uh, Saving Paradise. Uh, this one right here is, is my fifth published book. Uh, I have another one, as I said, uh, 
uh, that's going to come out this, this year, probably in the fall, called Assassins, and that deals with, uh, or it's set in the midst of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, but it goes back to the beginning of our first involvement in combat in, in Afghanistan, which was actually after it had, it had been uh, invaded by the Russians in the early 1980s. We were already back then uh, involved in providing uh, uh, <coughs> ground to air missiles and all kinds of other uh, armaments to the uh, Afghani uh, resistance. Let's just, I'll just leave it alone. <laughs> okay, well, and where can people buy your books? Uh, pretty much anywhere, Julia. Uh, buy them at uh, online if, uh, or at your local bookstore. Uh, they're carried by Barnes and Noble and Amazon, both as as an ebook uh, or Kindle, as well, and also as a print book. Uh, they should be at the local library. At least Saving Paradise should be at the local library. And uh, if not, you can always uh, request it, and they'll bring it in. Uh, and uh, you can buy it as an iTunes. So you can buy it. At, if you've got a local Barnes and Noble, or, or even even if you have a uh, an independent bookstore, which would be wonderful, uh, go in there and, and they should have it. But if they don't, they can certainly get it quickly. Okay, all right. Well, so Mike, what did your book Saving Paradise? What kind of impact did that have uh, in Molokai? Well, that's a good question. I was stunned by the impact. Um, it, it's only been out uh, a couple of months, and it's kind of one of those books that's taken off by word of mouth, if you wish not, um, marketing. But uh, a couple of months after the book came out, uh, the landowner that was going to build these windmills on 17 square miles uh, of, of this property decided that he did a, a, an analysis of property values and found that the adjoining properties, which they also own, would go down 75% of property value, and that's one of the major reasons why they pulled out and, and decided against they actually killed the project. But I was told that there were many other facets involved, and the book certainly, because the book talks about property values consistently, um, that the book, as well as the enormous and principally the enormous public outrage on the part of uh, the people in Molokai, 97% of the people in two surveys were against the project. Uh, this finally killed it. Uh, and so, but basically the important thing is that uh, a book of fiction, because it puts you in an emotional situation, because it pulls you in, because you care about the characters if it's well done, uh, because it's coming straight from the writer's heart, that fiction makes you experience what's going on, as I said a minute ago, makes you experience what's actually going on and gives you the feeling of having been there. And then you can make a judgment more accurately about whether you feel it's good or bad, that situation. Um, I mean, I wrote about uh, ivory poaching from the point of view of the elephants and from the point of view of the local Africans who have to deal with the problem. Uh, I wrote about the death squads in Latin America from the point of view of, of, view of the people being killed by the death squads. And that particular book had a significant impact on our pulling uh, financing uh, out of some of the uh, horribly fascist Central American dictatorships of the 1980s, principally El Salvador uh, and Guatemala. And uh, so fiction can have a dynamite effect. And right, right now where we have the situation I mentioned in Maine where uh, you have the oversight on the wind projects that's being done by people in the wind uh, companies, uh, at whom, as I said, are often uh, subsidiary companies to oil companies. Uh, and some of the state legislators and much of the bureaucrats, as well as all the environmentalists, the environmentalists haven't caught, caught on yet that wind power is a tragedy, an environmental tragedy, and in no way reduces greenhouse gases. They haven't figured that out yet. So you get outfits like the Sierra Club, who uh, got their hands caught last year in the cookie jar taking $29 million from uh, the Natural Gas Association of the United States in return for not criticizing fracking. They're now taking money from the wind projects in return, and the wind developers, whom, as I said, are usually oil companies, in return for, for us, us not uh, opposing wind projects. Oh, so we've got this kind of 
We trust in what? the Sierra. We trust in yeah, the Sierra. Yeah, don't trust the Sierra Club anymore. They are they are turning into a lobbyist for the energy business. And uh, and I actually used to work for the Sierra Club. I edited books for them. I worked on projects. Uh, I've been involved in environmental activism all my life. And I have to say, the Sierra Club is lost in the woods and looking for corporate handouts. Oh, so, that's and so many disturbing. environmental groups are in the same thing, in the same situation. It's a tragedy. Uh, and the other thing is tourism. They don't care that uh, tourism is, in, is dying in places where they put in wind projects like Scotland. There are areas of Scotland no one goes to anymore. Who wants to go on vacation and look at these 45-story high howling turbines? So, uh, so anyway, back to you. And you, you, I do think that the book is having an impact, and it's going to continue. Uh, all my books have political impact, and that's part of the reason why I write. Well, good for you. Thank you. And um, did will you write a short guest blog for our blog? I certainly would love to. Great. Yeah. So and I, I will have it to you by tomorrow. All right, I want to encourage whoever might be watching this to read Mike's guest blog at tvbackstory.com, and there will be links to contact him. And do you have a website, Mike? Yes, I do, Julia. It's mikebondbooks.com, and uh, you can get all kinds of information on all my books there, how to contact me. Anybody who would like to chat, uh, send me an email through mikebondbooks.com. Uh, whether it's about Saving Paradise or The Lost Savannah or any of my other titles, uh, happy to talk, particularly happy to talk with young writers, with any writers young or old, and uh, maybe uh, give some advice that uh, would avoid some of the pitfalls I've managed to stumble into. But uh, I <laughs> okay. think uh, Talk Story TV is, is a great big uh, service to all writers and readers everywhere, so I thank you for that, and I certainly thank you for the honor of inviting me on the show. Thank you for being with us. Great. I will do as told and get you that 500 words. Great. <laughs>